Our Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day, for clearing your schedule for us. There couldn't be any greater sign of love than that you set aside your time for each one of us. And we thank you for that. We pray, Lord, as we uh, open your word tonight, we pray the Holy Spirit that inspired the prophets would guide us, guide our understanding, inspire our hearts tonight. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. How many of you believe that we're living in the last days? You do? Really? If we really believe we're living in the last days, it should change the way we live, shouldn't it? I want you to look at a text with me in the book of Matthew. We're going to start in Matthew 24 tonight. Matthew 24, when I say Matthew 24, you're probably thinking, oh yeah, that's the chapter that deals with what? All the signs of Christ's coming. Matthew 24, 24 is probably a text you're very well aware of. Matthew 24 And verse 24. Jesus says here, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, what? Even the elect. Who are the elect? Who who would the elect be? Those are going to be the people who have really had the most advantages, the most opportunities to know and practice the truth. The elect are going to be the people the most likely to succeed, the ones you would least expect would get tripped up by false Christ and false prophets. And I would like to think that we're among that group. But even the elect would be deceived if possible. The the deceptions are going to be so great in the last days. And we just all said that we believe that's where we are. We're living in the last days. Now, in that same chapter, in verse 6, I want you to notice what it says. Actually, verse 5 is what I want to look at. Let's go to verse 4. Verse 4 is what I want to look at. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now, how many of you have heard of some of these people in history, like uh, Jim Jones and the Jonestown, Guyana tragedy, where everybody drank the Kool-Aid, cyanide-laced, and... Oh, okay. At first, I saw like two hands, and I was like, okay, let's think of another example. Um, or, or, Or David Koresh, or how about a recent one? How about this guy... Uh, Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda down in Florida who has this great... How many? Let me see some hands who have heard that name. This is a guy, he's down in Florida, currently has a church of over a million people. He claims to be both Jesus Christ and the Antichrist at the same time. Now, it's interesting, he makes a good application. The word Antichrist is only used in the letters of John. I believe it's, I believe it's 1 John and 2 John. And the word literally means one who takes the place of Christ or or stands in the place of Christ. He puts a positive spin and he says, I'm the Antichrist in the sense that Jesus Christ was was um, came from God and now I have come from God also, but I'm a greater revelation of God than Jesus Christ was. Anyway, this is what he says. He's got a million people plus that are his followers. They donate money left and right. He teaches that Jesus... Uh, rather, he teaches that there is no such thing as sin. After the cross, we are allowed, we're free to do whatever we want. There's no devil. There's no hell. Uh, life is a big party. And uh, one of the things he's urged his followers to do is actually tattoo themselves with 666. Now, isn't that nutty? Okay, and anyway, this is where... This is where... <laughs> here's the funny part. One of his followers who gets the 666 tattoo, says, well, if somebody comes along and tells us to drink a bunch of Kool-Aid, I'm not going to do that. Oh, but could you tattoo that 666? You know, and she got the tattoo. Anyway, I think she would drink the Kool-Aid, probably. (laughs) But if you look at verse 5, 
Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. That's typically what we think of. Somebody says, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. That's what Christ means. I'm, I'm the one sent from God. And the Bible says there would be false Christ. But I want you to notice something. I'm going to look at verse 5 a little different. Are you guys all sharing this Bible here? You guys need your Bibles. If we're in a last... T- was that? It's up here. You need it. I'm going to give you your Bible. You want to have this Bible. Because if we're living in the last days, a time of deception, the only way we're going to know right from wrong is God's Word. So I want to make sure you bring them tomorrow. If you're looking along in the Bible, it says, many will come in my name saying, and then in quotes, I am the Christ. You have to understand something though. When the Bible was originally written, those quotations weren't in there. That was added by translators later. I want to read it just a little different. Let's take the quotes out. And how would it read? Jesus says, many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ. Rather than saying, I am the Christ, Now the person may be coming in Jesus' name saying He is the Christ and will deceive many. Now think about it for a minute. I mean, even a million people in this church of Jose, Luis de Jesus, Miranda, a million seems like a lot, but compared to the total world population, it's a minority, right? And a minority isn't many. I think by far the more people that this applies to are those who come and claim to believe in Jesus Christ, but they're teaching things in the name of Jesus that Jesus never taught. Now, whether you view it that way or not, the point is the last days are a time of unparalleled deception. Now, this is why God has chosen to meet this deception with a message of truth. Go to Revelation 12 with me. Revelation chapter, not 12, 14, please. <clears throat> Revelation 14. <coughs> Revelation 14, verse 6. You're familiar with this, I'm sure. Revelation 14, verse 6. The Apostle John sees an angel. He says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the what? Everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, and tongue of people, saying with a... Okay, we're going to come back to that. With a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and do what? Worship Worship Him who made heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. So, to meet the deception at the end of time, God is sending out a message calling people back to worship the true God. It's a message of the proclamation of truth, and it's given with what kind of voice? A loud voice. Now, why do you give a message with a loud voice? So people can hear it? It's important, right? Imagine that you're standing out in the yard, and I'm standing nearby, and I see this limb on the tree that has just been kind of teetering there, and it snaps off, and it's coming and falling down on you. I say, "Um, you might want to move over. (laughs) Boom! You know, it's going to come down. You're probably not going to be, you're going to go, what? Why? Why? and the thing is going to hit you, right? Isn't that likely? But if I say, get out of the way, you're going to be much more likely to move, right? The message is given with a loud voice. It's an urgent message. It's a message that has to be given, listen to me carefully, with confidence and conviction. And the problem, one of the problems we face today in our church is there are too few who have a confidence and conviction about the whole of our message. And I say the whole of our message. That, well, you know, I believe Jesus died on the cross, but we get into some of the lifestyle things. I'm not quite sure. You're never going to give a message with a loud voice you don't believe. Amen. It's impossible. And so here God is needing a warning message to be given to planet Earth, but His people have to have a confidence in the message. And this in a setting where... Massive, unparalleled deception is taking place and people are confused, even God's people. So how do we gain the confidence that we need? Well, I want you to go to Proverbs 16 with me. 
Some people tell me, well, I know how I gain the confidence. I basically just go with, you know, if I know, if it's true, I feel it. Have you heard people say that? Maybe you've said it. Well, if it's true, I feel it. I'm just going to go with what my gut tells me. Has anybody ever gone that route? I don't want to see a show of hands because we're going to read in Proverbs 16.25 something very interesting. Proverbs 16, verse 25. Proverbs 16 and verse 25. Notice what the Bible says. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is what? But the end is the way of death. A way that seems right. And I'm just going to throw this in here as an alternative reading. A way that looks right. It looks right to me. Have you ever had a situation in your life where something looked like it would be right to you and you said, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. Does that mean there's nothing wrong with it? I want you to do something for me. I want you to spell the word shop for me. Okay, what's the first thing you do when you come to a green light? A green light. You know, I keep waiting for somebody to catch that. I figure one crowd's going to catch it, but every crowd falls for it. You know why? Because when we, listen carefully, when we trust our hearts, our hearts can lead us the wrong way. When we trust our feelings, our feelings can lead us the wrong way. Now that's kind of a funny little example, but what if that feeling has to do with your eternal destiny? Oh, I'm just going to go with what seems right. It does, I don't see anything wrong with it. Just because I don't see anything wrong with it doesn't mean there's not something wrong with it. There's a way that seems right to a man. But the end is the way of death. So what are we going to do about that? Go to Psalm 32 with me. Psalm 32 and verse 8. I love this text. Psalm 32 and verse 8. Look what the Lord promises to you and me. Psalm 32, verse 8. God says here, I will what? Instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eyes. See, if I trust my eyes, my eyes deceive me. What I see deceives me. What I feel deceives me. But God says, no problem. I see things the right way and I promise that I'll instruct you and I'll guide you with the way I see instead of the way you see. Now that's important. Not only is it important, it's essential. When we live in the last days and we have unparalleled deception going on, the only thing we can trust in is the way God sees, not the way we see. Are you following me so far? The Apostle Paul says that we are to walk by faith, not by sight, because our sight can mislead us. So God says, I'm going to guide you with my eye. Now I want you to look at an interesting text in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel, chapter 9. And verse 9. 1 Samuel 9 and verse 9. Notice what the Bible says here. It says, 1 Samuel 9, 9, Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God... He spoke thus, Come, let us go to the what? The seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Why was a prophet called a seer? They saw it the way God saw it. A prophet saw things not with man's eyes, but with God's eyes. And I want you to understand something, that when we live in a time when we can't trust our eyes, and God says, I'll guide you with my eye, I'm going to suggest to you that the way He guides His church with His eye is through the prophet. At least in part. The prophet was called the seer. The prophet would see things the way God saw things. Now I want you to go to Revelation with me, chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. 
We're going to be in verse 17 here. This is in the context of a letter to the church of Laodicea. Who is the church of Laodicea? Us. Us. We, 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 we're so used to it, we say it without any pain anymore. That's us. Oh, Laodicea. <laughs> I tell people, you know, sometimes we talk about the Adventist church in the role of the remnant church. And I believe that with all my heart. We fit the description of the remnant church. And, and sometimes people say, oh, you guys, you just you want to brag about being the remnant. Hold on there. <laughs> we get the double honor of being called the remnant and the Laodicean church. One feels good, the other doesn't feel so good, but it, it applies to us. But Laodicea also, besides us, is in the scheme of Revelation's churches, what church is it? It's the last church. It's the last day church, right? We said we're living in the last days. Notice what God says about the last day church. And one of the big problems with the last day church, some of which we'll build on more tomorrow, He says in verse 16, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. So this is a church that doesn't sense its own true condition. And the Lord says, And you do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, what's that next word? blind and naked. The last day church is a blind church. The last day church needs eyesight. I salve in this case. Needs help in its spiritual vision. And you know what God did for the last day church and its blindness problem? The Bible says that the last day church would have the testimony of Jesus or the gift of prophecy. The message title tonight is Ellen White, Why Should I Care? That's the generation we live in today. It's like, oh, Ellen White. Now, I sense a little bit different probably from this crowd. But even then, the Bible tells us the devil's enraged with two things about the last day church. The fact that they feel they ought to be keeping God's commandments and the fact that they have the testimony of Jesus. And if the devil's enraged with something, he is not going to give up fighting against that something until he's put down. I just met with a couple in my church. I hate to say it, but I met with it. This is a reality. With a couple in my church back home who no longer want to be Seventh-day Adventists. Why? Because they don't believe in Ellen White. People say, do I have to believe in Ellen White to be a Seventh-day Adventist? A person who asks that question is not really picking up on where we are in time. Is not picking up on the fact that the church is blind. Is not picking up on the fact that we can't determine where to stand by just how we feel. They're not picking up on the fact that we live in a time of unparalleled deception and God has chosen to help His church to navigate through the time of deception by giving us a special gift that would give us spiritual eyesight to know where to stand, when to stand, and how to stand. God answers this blindness problem, I believe, by giving the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is what... God has given, it's not the only gift He's given for this purpose either, mind you, but God has given the gift of prophecy to help us to have confidence in what we believe in, to help us to know that we're on the right track spiritually so we can have the confidence to give the message with a loud voice. I believe... that a Seventh-day Adventist should regard the writings of Ellen White as a clear indicator of how God wants us to believe, where He wants us to stand, what direction He wants us to take, not to supersede the Bible. We'll get into that this weekend. Listen to me carefully. A lot of people have a problem with, with Ellen White because they don't know what a prophet is. 
They've not studied prophets from a biblical standard or from a biblical vantage point. They don't realize that Ellen White's not the only prophet that's existed. There have been prophets all through the Bible. In fact, some people say, well, I, 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 I believe in the Bible and I, I don't necessarily feel I need Ellen White because I have the Bible and so I don't necessarily need a prophet because I have the Bible, not realizing that the only reason you have a Bible is because of prophets. Oh, let's look at the authors here. Oh, Revelation, John. Oh, he, I guess he was a prophet. Uh, Romans, Paul. Oh, Paul had the gift of prophecy. Hmm, let's find another one. Uh, oh, Ezekiel was prophet. Daniel, oh, Jeremiah, prophet, prophet, prophet. God spoke through the prophets in times past. And listen to me carefully. This was the role of the prophets. In fact, the Bible uses a term called the law and the prophets. Have you ever heard this before? Or the law and the testimony, right? Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Same thing. Law and the prophets, law and the testimony. What was the role of the prophet? The law, and you have to understand this, in in the Old Testament times, when you read that word law, in, in most places, it's the Hebrew word Torah. Okay? And to them, that was the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, are you aware of that? Does anybody know what the word Torah means? Doesn't mean law. Doesn't mean books. Well, uh, I guess you would say back into the agricultural biological meaning. It seems back it would go from yara, which basically meant to cast forth either fruit or, um, or rain. <laughs> okay, the layman's terms here. Thank you. Instruction. <laughs> Instruction. No, that was a very good answer. It was very comprehensive. In fact, I learned something there. I didn't even know the agricultural thing. I just know that it means instruction. <laughs> and, and listen to me. So the law and the testimony, the idea was that the role of the prophet, whether it's Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Daniel or Ellen White, was to point God's people back to the instruction. And so, keep in mind, when Jeremiah showed up on the scene, he wasn't in the Bible. He was a modern prophet. They had their Bible, and then there was Jeremiah. Now, later on, Jeremiah was canonized. But then you have the Apostle Paul. He had the gift of prophecy. And so you have the Bible, and then you have the Apostle Paul as a modern prophet. What was the role of the modern prophet? To point people back to the instruction of God, to help them to know which direction to go, to give them clarity and confidence in the truth. So God has done that at the end of time. Now some people, like I said, not understanding the role of a prophet, they get a little skittish. They say, well, I don't know. I mean, should we really have, should Ellen White have any kind of influence on on what we believe? You know, when I come out and say something like, God gave the gift of prophecy to Ellen White so we would know where to stand. Well, I thought he gave us the Bible to know where to stand. He did. We just don't follow it most of the time. I mean, look in, look in prophetic history. Why did Jeremiah come on the scene? He wouldn't have had to come on the scene if God's people had been faithful. And incidentally, when Jeremiah showed up, the Bible tells us that all the people wanted to kill him. <clears throat> the prophet pointed people back to what God's Word said. Helped to correct them from wrong paths and get them in the right path. Helped to guide them where God wanted them to go so they were standing on solid ground again so that they would have confidence in the message and that they would be united on the message. You know, that's another important point. Jesus himself said a house divided against itself can't stand. What about a church divided against itself? What do you do when you have a bunch of people divided against themselves? They need confidence in the message that God's given. Well... God provided the gift of prophecy for that. I want you to see it in two places with me. We're going to Acts 15. Acts 15. I want you to see how it worked in Bible times, how this gift worked, how this gift brought direction and clarity and confidence in where God wanted His people to stand when there were confused ideas of truth. Acts 15, verse 1. The Bible says that controversy arose over a certain issue. Acts 15, verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
Verse 2, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So, you've got two different groups and they're reading different passages in the Scripture. Incidentally, the only Scripture they had is Old Testament. And one group is saying, well, if a Gentile is going to become a believer, he's got to be circumcised. And the other group is saying, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that's what God is teaching. Well, they're both reading the Bible. They both got these differing viewpoints. So what do they do? They say, you know what we need to do? We need to go up to church headquarters. We need to come together. We need to study together. We need to pray together. And we need to find out where God wants us to stand. Now notice what happens. In this context, verse 6 says, Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, has anybody ever been in a religious discussion where there's been much dispute? They've discussed it. Well, I think it's this and I think it's this. And so there's been quite a bit of discussion that's gone on. And notice where, when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. I'm going to challenge you to draw back from your memory banks tonight some place, because Peter says, you know. He talks to the crowd and he says, you guys know this. So he's talking about something that they know and that we probably know. It's probably somewhere in the New Testament. And he says, you guys know how God chose that the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel from my mouth. Where in the New Testament do we find a place where God singles out Peter to communicate to the Gentiles? Acts chapter 10, what were you going to say? The vision with the sheet. You know where it's found? Acts chapter 10. So you're right. She's like, oh, did I get it right or wrong? Or You were correct. Acts chapter 10, the vision of the sheet. You remember that? Men were coming from the house of Cornelius. They were Gentiles. Peter went up on the housetop to pray. A sheet comes down from heaven. Has all these unclean animals in it. Says, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, no, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Sheet goes up, comes down again. Three times it happens. The whole thing gets over with. And Peter says... I was wondering what the vision meant. Now, it's interesting to me because a lot of our evangelical friends, they're sure they know what the vision means, even though Peter didn't know what the vision meant. They're sure it means you can eat anything. But that's not what Peter was sure of when it was done with. He never did take anything out of the sheet. But later on in the chapter, he says, God showed me that I shouldn't call any man common or unclean. Okay? And that experience is where Peter was called to give the gospel to the Gentiles. The whole church knew about it. And if you refer to non-Adventist commentators in Acts 15, they're agreed that when Peter says, Brethren, you know that God chose by my mouth, etc., they're agreed that Peter is referring back to Acts chapter 10. Now, why is that significant to us? Here's why. What was it in Acts chapter 10 that Peter's referring to? A vision. So here's the church and they're confused over a point of doctrine and they don't know which way to go and so they have a meeting together and what is it that brings clarity over the point of doctrine in the meeting so the church can unite? A vision. And so people come up to me today and they say, well, I don't like the way Ellen White... Well, you're not going to like the way Peter dealt with it either. The fact is we can do nothing better than have a biblical precedent. And we go back in the Bible, in the, in the New Testament church, we say, how did they deal with things there? When they had the dispute, Peter stands up, and what does he do? But he, he, he refers back to a vision God gave him that everybody's aware of. And, 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 and from that vantage point of his prophetic gift and prophetic authority, he gives his testimony. When he's done giving his testimony... It says, verse 12, that all the multitude kept silent and listened to Paul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Paul rather, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the what? Some of you lost your place. Acts 15, verse 15. 
With this, the words of the prophets agree. So in other words, Peter refers to his vision. Paul and Barnabas get up and say, you know what? Our experience out in the field verifies what Peter's telling us. And then James gets up, who's evidently presiding over the meeting, and he says, you know what? Everything Peter's saying is in accordance with what all the other prophets have said. They accept his testimony. They come together in agreement. And then they broadcast to all the churches that this is where we're going to stand. And you know what happens? Now everybody is united. They have confidence in what they believe. And they go from there and proclaim the message and the church grows. And I would dare say to you that the, one of the biggest issues and challenges we have today is that today we're not allowing the prophetic gift to have the role that the early church let it have. If we did, there would be much less bickering, much more unity, and instead of bickering amongst ourselves, we'd get the work done. And Jesus would come. Why is it important to believe in Ellen White? Why should I care? You want to be on this planet any longer than you need to be? I'm asking the wrong question. Because I know how young people do. They say, well, at least I want to get that girl and get married first. (laughs) Let me tell you something. Heaven will not be a letdown. It is not going to be a letdown. Don't think, well, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be old and playing shuffleboard in heaven or something like that. No, you'll have a good life in heaven. Shuffleboard is a game that old people play. (laughs) They're all like, huh? Anyway. Uh, What does that say about myself? I don't know. I guess that's... But listen to me. The Lord has given a gift to help us to find that unity and finish the work He's given us to do. I want to to finish uh, with a story in our history of a man who, early in the Adventist movement, accepted the message. It was in 1850. His name was Stephen Smith. And he accepted the Adventist message, but he had one problem. His problem was this Ellen White woman. He didn't like the idea of some woman telling him what was up, having to tell him what to believe. And so he had some issues with it, and it wasn't long before... Stephen Smith left the church. Now, his wife stayed in the church. Ellen White had count... What what, what happened when he left the church is you you have to understand a little of our history here. After 1844, the Seventh-day Adventists realized that they had misunderstood what the prophecy was foretelling. Rather than foretelling the coming of Jesus to the earth, it was foretelling what was happening in his priestly ministry. But not everybody agreed with that. Some people said, well, we just got the time wrong. He's not going to come in 1844. He's going to come in 1845. Oh, wait, he's going to come in 1846. Oh, wait, he's going to come in 1847. And so they would set date after date after date. Stephen Smith got caught up in those movements. He became one of the bitterest enemies of Adventists. And he would join one movement after another and he would just... They said he had the sharpest, most critical tongue of anybody that anybody knew. He would just... And and especially against Ellen and James White. He just really hated the Whites. And Ellen White counseled him on on at least a couple of occasions about the direction he was going, but he wouldn't hear it, wouldn't have it. So she wrote him a letter... And when Stephen Smith got that letter from Ellen White, he was so angry when he got it that she would dare send him a letter. He didn't know what to do with it, and Stephen Smith had that letter in his hand. He got it from the mail. He was going into his house, and he looked around in his house, and he saw an old trunk in the house, and he lifted up the trunk, and there was all kinds of stuff in it, and he shoved that thing down in the bottom of that trunk, and he forgot about it. For 28 years, he forgot about it. Meanwhile, he went on fighting against the Adventists, fighting against James and Ellen White, joining one movement, then another movement, then another movement, and then another movement. Until he got pretty worn out of jumping around from movement to movement. Meanwhile, his wife was a Seventh-day Adventist. His wife got the Adventist Review. That Adventist Review sat there in their home. Ellen White had articles that appeared in the Adventist Review. And one time later in life, at that... 27, 28 year point 
I think it was about 27 years into it, he pulled out that Adventist view, review and he read it. Read an article by Ellen White and he was just impressed with how true it appeared to him. He's like, wow, that just something, that seems right to me. Now, of course, I think this time it was right. He read that article. He read another one. And over the course of time, he read more articles and it, he started to soften a little bit. And it was about this time that a young man named Eugene Farnsworth came around to preach. Now, Eugene was there when Stephen Smith had joined the church. He knew the family. Eugene was just a little boy. He knew the family well, and he thought, wow, Eugene's in town, and he's a preacher now. I ought to go say hi to him. I want to go see him. And so he went out to this church where he heard Eugene was preaching and holding a meeting. And that particular night, Eugene was preaching on the Advent movement. It was customary in those days when a person finished preaching that then they would have this period of time where everybody would give testimony about the message and, and uh, uh, comments about that and what the Lord has done in their life and what have you. And so when the message was finished, when, when uh, Eugene finished his message, Stephen Smith stood up. And of course, everybody in that house of worship said, oh boy, this guy's going to start ranting about how much the Adventist is a deceptive church and da-da-da-da. And Eugene is looking at him and thinking as the preacher, do I let this guy talk, do I not? Oh, well, I may as well let him get it out of his system. And this is what Eugene, uh, this is what Stephen Smith said. He said, brethren, I don't want you to be afraid of me. I haven't come to criticize you. I've quit that kind of business. Facts are stubborn things, but the facts are that those who have opposed this work have come to Nothing. And those who have been in sympathy with it, the work of the Seventh-day Adventists, have prospered, have grown better, have grown more devoted, have grown more godlike. Those who have opposed it have only learned how to fight and debate and they've lost all their religion. No honest man can help but see that the Lord is with them and against us. Whew! What a testimony. He said, in essence, I've gone to this movement and all these movements I've been in haven't made me more like Christ. They've just messed me up. And I look at the Adventists and I see where I made my mistake. I should have stuck with them. On his way home from the meeting that night, what do you think came to his mind? He remembered the letter in the trunk. He goes home, he sees the trunk, he fishes around in it, in the bottom of the trunk, and there he pulls it out, the letter that was written to him 28 years ago. And in that letter, Ellen White wrote to him 28 years ago what his life would be if he continued on the course he was on. What do you think he read in that letter? He read in retrospect exactly what his life had been. I want to tell you something. You know, there are, you've got all this anti-Adventist stuff on websites. They'll never tell you the Stephen Smith story. And there's a hundred others like them. Hundreds of others like this. Where you know only the Spirit of God could have been working in the situation. Stephen Smith read that letter and he saw this testimony of what his life would have been, but because he never changed his course, that's exactly what his life had been. The next night he went out to the meeting, it was a few nights later, he wanted to go again. Farnsworth preaches on the gift of prophecy in the remnant church. End of the meeting, Stephen Smith is on his feet again. And this is what he said. I received a testimony myself 28 years ago. And I took it home and I locked it up in my trunk and I never read it until last Thursday night. He said he was afraid it would make him mad. But I've been mad for these 28 years anyway, he said. And every word is true and I accept it and I've come to the place where I believe these writings are of God. If I had heeded, it would have changed the whole course of my life. And I would have been a very different man. Any man that is honest may say that they lead a man toward God in the Bible always. If he's honest, he'll say that. If he won't say that, he's not honest. He said, I'm too old to undo what I've done, but I want to tell people everywhere that another rebel has surrendered. I'm going to share with you a little bit tomorrow morning 
of how the Lord was able to reach me when I was in my mid-twenties. And I still have to live with the regrets of not having chosen to follow Christ earlier. I could have been a very different man. Even today, let me tell you something in your youth. Even if you, you look at these stories, you say, I know people that are 25 or 30, they gave their heart to the Lord. Yeah, and you know what they had? They had the baggage of 30 years that they're going to have to fight the rest of their lives. I cannot overemphasize to you how important it is in your youth to choose Christ and form right character. It'll make every battle of life easier. Stephen Smith saw it in his old age. Old, he had only heeded. And I want to tell you something. God has given us a precious gift of light in these last days so that we don't have to tell that story of Stephen Smith. Oh, I could have been a very different man. I could have been a very different woman. But by God's grace, I am. I want to finish with one passage, and that passage is in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 20. Second Chronicles, chapter 20. And verse 20. Just think of 2020 vision. God's vision. Second Chronicles 20, verse 20. Notice what the Lord says here. It says, So they arose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Notice, believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his what? Prophets, and you will prosper. My young people, God wants us to prosper. And God wants us to gain the victory. God wants us to hasten the day of Jesus. And when He comes to be those people that say, Here is our God, we have waited for Him, and He will save us. God doesn't want us to have to tell a testimony like Stephen Smith about what our life could have been had we been faithful. God wants us to be among the faithful. And my challenge to you tonight and this weekend is that you will allow God to confirm you in the truth, to bring that confidence in your heart so you can be a part of that prospering movement that gives the message with a loud cry and ushers in the coming of Jesus. You want to be a part of that tonight? Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, Father, I do thank you for your mercy toward us. Lord, sometimes we... Not sometimes, Lord. It's our nature to resist correction, to resist counsel. We pray for the humility of Jesus where we would be open and teachable. We pray, Father, that we would be among those who prosper with this work that you've raised up in the earth. Just as Stephen Smith said, every other place that he went that he thought was right was wrong. And while all those movements fell by the wayside, your work continued to prosper. We know it will prosper until the coming of Jesus. We want to prosper with it. Father, help us to have hearts that are open and teachable. Bless each one here tonight as we've raised our hands and said, Lord, we want that that openness. We want that willingness to follow wherever you lead. Bless us according to this end. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This is a digital recording for optimum sound quality. International copyright, all rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls down 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministry.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage you. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He is coming soon.